This is our uh, lecture number 17. We're on uh, in the general area of the study of memory and consciousness. And uh, this is a uh, another um, fascinating area of study. Now that you know a little bit about learning and classical conditioning and operant conditioning, uh, I think that that will uh, help you a great deal in order to uh, further uh, expand your, your knowledge uh, in the area of psychology in terms of memory and the formation of memories. So uh, I guess begin uh, this assessment by acknowledging the fact that uh, uh, this is an area where psychologists uh, really have made some very important uh, uh, contributions. And uh, it really uh, spans a, a number of different sub-disciplines and sub-areas within psychology that uh, have proven to be very important for um, understanding uh, memory processing. So we do uh, explore um, the study of memory. One of the first things that we do is we take a look at what's called the three stages of memory. You know, psychologists very firmly believe uh, that there are three separate components to uh, memory processing. So let's take a look at these. Uh, the first is uh, what is called the sensory register. Okay, we're going to go from left to right here uh, on this slide. Um, and the sensory register maintains a, a literal image of everything that's going on uh, in our sensory world. Uh, its capacity is extremely large, uh, can contain a lot of information uh, at once, um, but it's only going to stay there for really a very brief period of time. For example, uh, for a visual stimulus, uh, maybe about a half second. For an auditory stimulus, maybe about two seconds. Um, and I'm, quite frankly, a lot of that information is going to be forgotten, but certainly a fair amount of it uh, is also going to be transferred uh, into this uh, short-term memory system. You'll very frequently just see the, this acronym STM, capital STM. Um, this uh, part of our uh, memory uh, is limited in terms of its capacity. Um, you know, can't hold too much information at once. Um, it stores items maybe up to about 30 seconds. Uh, and again, if there's no rehearsal, then it's going to be forgotten. Uh, but if it is rehearsed, um, then it stands a very good chance of ultimately being transferred into our uh, long-term memory system. Um, uh, when I say limited capacity, I mean, one of the best examples of this is, is trying to remember a series of numbers. Um, you know, if you were given the, the numbers uh, uh, 5, 6, uh, 25, uh, 44, 16, 18, 23, and 10, uh, chances are you probably wouldn't be able to remember anything beyond about eight or nine digits, uh, eight or nine numbers. Uh, once you get up beyond that, it's very difficult uh, uh, to remember. And again, it's because the capacity of that short-term memory system is relatively limited. So you can remember your own telephone number very well and maybe telephone numbers of other of some other individuals. Uh, but unless you but if you're given a new number, chances are you're not going to be able to remember that, not unless you uh, actively rehearse it. And um, again, this is our uh, what many refer to as our working memory, memory, our short-term memory. Um, our long-term memory, on the other hand, um, also referred to uh, as, uh, you know, capital LTM. Uh, again, that's the, the uh, acronym, has unlimited capacity. Uh, the storage of information in our long-term memory is thought to be uh, permanent, uh, unlike what we see in our sensory register or in our short-term store. Uh, and the information is organized and it's indexed almost like what you would see in, in terms of a library, in books in a library. I mean, it's very uh, detailed kind of organization that occurs. Um, one of the things that psychologists have tried to do is to separate these, these different uh, stages uh, that you see here. 
And in particular, uh, there's a lot of very interesting research, which, which has shown, I think, quite definitively that our short-term uh, system is very different from our long-term system. And that's part of what we'll be doing is, is running through some interesting experiments, which I think, um, you know, help us to understand that and appreciate that. So evidence for short and long-term memory, it's really coming from um, uh, three uh, basic areas. It's coming from what we call free recall studies, and I'll give you an example of this in just a few moments. It's also coming from clinical observations, uh, and it's also coming from uh, actual uh, experimental work that has been done in the area of what's called memory consolidation. So we'll, again, I wanna give you examples of each one of these, because I think that'll help you to understand these concepts very well. Um, uh, very interesting study conducted a number of years ago, very repeatable, and one that uh, I would encourage you to, to maybe do with a roommate uh, or a close friend sometime. Uh, and this is something that is referred to as the serial position cur curve. Uh, take a look at this list of words that you see here, common, common words, nouns, okay? Tree, house, rock, car, store, road, glass, truck, pencil, lamp, street, light, ball, branch, tire. Let's say I read those list of words to you, uh, and then I tested you immediately afterwards. That is no delay. I simply read the words to you, and then I say, try to remember as many of them as you possibly can. And then we plot it on a curve, um, your ability to remember those words, that is the number of words that you correctly uh, remember. And then we take, we plot that as a function of the uh, position of the words in the list, okay? So for example, word one was tree, word two is house and so on, uh, word 14 is branch, word 15 is tire. So take a look now at the blue curve uh, that you see there. And what that shows is that words at the beginning of the list, words like tree and house, for example, uh, and rock, are remembered quite well. Words uh, at the end of the list, like uh, ball, branch, and tire, also are remembered very well. But words in the middle of the list really aren't remembered all that well. Words like road, glass, truck, pencil, lamp, okay? And um, uh, those working in the study of memory believe that this represents what we call a primacy effect. That is, these words, we've had an opportunity to rehearse a lot, so they're getting into long-term memory. Words um, uh, right here at the end of the list, this, this represents a recency effect. These are in our short-term memory. They still haven't been transferred into our long-term memory. And uh, indeed, uh, the words that are in the middle of the list, they're kind of in limbo. I mean, they're, they're really not recalled, remembered all that well. But now let's change things up a little bit. Let's do this experiment a little bit differently. Uh, instead, uh, what we'll do is we'll read the list of words. Uh, and then what we'll do is there will be a delay for 30 seconds. But during that 30 second period of time, subjects are gonna be asked to count backwards. 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, and so on, down to zero. Let's see what happens in terms of their recall. Take a look at this gold line that you see here. Here you can see words at the beginning of the list remembered quite well, treehouse, tree and house in particular. Words now at the end of the list are not remembered very well. Ball branch tire, for example. Not like what we see in this curve right here. So obviously um, there's a lot of interference that's going on here. Um, interference in terms of your, um, you know, counting uh, backwards uh, uh, from 30 uh, down to zero. That's interfering with uh, the, the memory that you see. So you get no recency effect. And indeed, uh, this is a thought to represent the, the fact that uh, short-term memory is, is being uh, interfered with. And indeed, that's one of the major theories of forgetting is interference. <clears throat> that if you do something, um, uh, maybe you're doing some studying and all of a sudden there's some interference that uh, that takes place uh, you know while you're studying you're not going to remember that material anywhere near as well 
Okay, so again, um, th this is uh, what's called the serial position curve. It's very reproducible, uh, and it's thought to represent the, really the difference between short-term and long-term memory. Again, here you've selectively interfered with uh, short-term memory, uh, while long-term memory has been left uh, intact, and long-term memory is fine. So again, you can selectively interfere <clears throat> with that uh, short-term memory. A second area of support comes from actual clinical observations of individuals, uh, epileptic patients who have their uh, temporal lobes removed. Now we're gonna talk about this uh, quite a bit later on uh, when we get into some other areas, but this is a last resort procedure, uh, uh, removal uh, a part of the temporal lobe in order to um, uh, prevent uh, future what are called grand mal epileptic seizures. Uh, and what happens uh, as a consequence of, of this is that individuals permanently lose the ability to transfer new information from their short-term memory into their long-term memory. So they get have permanent deficits in their ability to do that. Um, their long-term memory is fine, uh, but that transfer of new information uh, from short to long-term memory has been um, impaired. So again, more support for this, you know, two separate memory mechanisms, a short and a long-term system. There's also work uh, that has been done uh, in terms of, uh, you know, clinical observations and uh, what we call memory consolidation studies. Uh, individuals that ha have received trauma uh, uh, to, to their uh, brain. Uh, maybe a person who's been in a car accident. You know, those individuals very frequently report uh, that they cannot remember um, uh, events, you know, right before the accident, uh, but they have no problem remembering um, uh, things like their telephone number, their name, the names of friends, the names of family members, where they live, so on. Those, those things that have been stored into their long-term uh, memory system. Um, uh, so again, short-term memory uh, seems to be uh, impaired in, in these situations, but long-term memory is, is not. Again, more support for this, you know, dual memory kind of a system. We also have cases of um, uh, uh, that have been noted uh, uh, when electroconvulsive shock therapy is used for the treatment of individuals that are uh, depressed, uh, very se severe clinical depression. Um, electroconvulsive shock therapy results in a situation where a person, um, uh, their, their uh, memory of events uh, leading up to the electroconvulsive shock that is maybe a, a half hour beforehand, anything that occurs a half hour beforehand or an hour beforehand, that's all been but been obliterated. But their long-term memory is fine. They know who they are. They know their friends. They know their own telephone numbers. They, they know where they live. They know, you know, the, that those kinds of uh, uh, memories have, uh, have not been impaired. Uh, so indeed, this is more support for this idea that um, uh, we have a, a short-term and a long-term memory system. Um, there's also interesting laboratory studies that have been done uh, with rats on memory consolidation. And here's, here's one that has uh, been used. Here's a rat that is um, uh, actually up on a, on a book. Uh, and that book is probably about an inch and a half to two inches thick. Uh, the natural tendency of a rat that's been placed in this kind of a situation is to step down. And in this particular apparatus uh, right here, if they step down, they're going to get shocked to their feet. So if you were to take that animal then and uh, several hours later, place the animal back up on this book, uh, uh, typically what would happen is the animal would stay there. Uh, they wouldn't step down. And the reason that they wouldn't step down is they remember okay, that they've, they've been shocked. So they'll, they'll just stay up there and they will not step down. But if you were to take an animal and uh, allow that uh, a new animal, place it up on this book, and again, the animal uh, steps down, gets shocked to its feet, but then administer an electroconvulsive shock to the animal. And then several hours later, place the animal back up uh, on this book. What happens is the animal now forgets that stepping down is gonna result in shock to its feet.
Okay, that's what the electroconvulsive shock done, has done. It's obliterated the animal's short-term memory. So indeed, these are interesting uh, uh, studies, which I think really support this whole idea that we do have two separate uh, memory systems. Now, when we take a look <clears throat> at memory research, uh, very frequently it's referred to as the search for the engram, meaning <clears throat> scientists, psychologists uh, in particular, have been very interested in but you know exactly what is the physical trace of memory. Uh, and uh, for the most part, what they've concluded is that when we learn anything, anything that is new, it's gonna result in a change in the brain, in the biochemistry of the brain. Some believe that it's an electrical change that takes place. Some believe that there's an actual structural change that takes place. Some believe that there's an actual change that occurs in, in terms of uh, um, the uh, production of, of new proteins. Uh, and some believe that there are changes in neurotransmitters and changes in hormones. What I want to do is I want to give you evidence from a variety of different areas that that will you know that tend to support these these claims. And I think more than anything suggests that what we're talking about is a, you know multiple kinds of uh, uh, biochemical, uh, physiological, uh, electrophysiological, morphological changes that uh, that are important for memory processing. When we go back <clears throat> to some of the oldest research in this area, certainly one of the classic uh, pieces of research was, was work that was done by Carl Lashley. And what Carl Lashley did was a very simple experiment in which he trained uh, rats in a very complex maze, uh, trained them up to a criterion where they were performing really well and you know, just rapidly going through this maze from the start area to the goal area, making very few errors. Uh, in order to obtain uh, uh, food, a food reward. And then uh, after the animals had learned this particular response, what Lashley did <clears throat> was to perform what he called cortical knife cuts. You see these blue markings here? Again, this is the brain of a rat. These blue markings represent knife cuts. So here's a knife cut here, here's a knife cut here. Here's one that's here, here's one here, here's one here, here's one here. So each rat that he trains now and does a cortical knife cut is going to get, uh, and, and is trained in that maze, is going to get a cortical knife cut. And <clears throat> for some animals, it'll be here. For some animals, it'll be here. For some animals, it'll be here. For some, it'll be here. You know, each animal gets a different knife cut, okay, in the uh, cortex. Um, uh, he also takes some other animals and performs what he calls tissue ablations. Uh, and those tissue ablations, what he's doing is he's actually cutting out, you know, parts of the cortex uh, of the brain. So uh, the animals then, after this surgical procedure uh, is done, whether it's a cortical knife, a knife cut or an ablation, uh, the animals are placed back in the maze and uh, they explore their ability to remember what they've learned. And indeed, what Lashley finds is that uh, it doesn't really matter where the knife cut is, doesn't matter really what, what tissue is taken out. Um, the, the animals are still able to remember um, uh, how to navigate through uh, that maze. Um, and uh, indeed, Lashley concludes that memories uh, are really spread throughout the brain, throughout the tissue. When one area is gone, another area can take over for it. When one area is cut, uh, another area can take over for it. So that was a, you know, a very, you know, interesting finding, but one which in some ways um, uh, w w was quite naive, given uh, the nature and complexity of, of uh, different types of memory. Um, so along some years later, comes another researcher by the name of Richard Thompson, who does fascinating work in which he's actually able to locate you know, very, very precisely um, the, the, the locus, that is the focus for um, a classical conditioning of a very, very simple response, what's called the, uh, the rabbit's uh, eye blink uh, response. Uh, if you were to direct uh, a puff of air towards uh, an animal, uh, a rabbit's eye, the rabbit's eye would close down, okay, uh, very rapidly, okay, it would blink. 
Um, and if you coupled that with uh, a tone, <clears throat> uh, that is the tone sounds and then the puff of air comes towards the, the rabbit's eye and the rabbit's eye uh, closes down and then opens up. If you were to combine um, that, that uh, uh, noise uh, with the puff of air, uh, many times over and then just present the, uh, uh, the noise. The animal would blink in response to the noise. That's a classically conditioned response. And what Thompson does is he takes a look uh, at uh, where most of the activity is taking place, uh, electrophysiological activity that's taking place during this act of learning, and he finds out that it's in this pathway in the cerebellum here uh, between what's called the red nucleus, okay, and the LPN, the lateral pontane nucleus. So when he trains some animals in this classically conditioned response, and they learn it rapidly, and then he removes this LPN that you see here. Surgically removing that LPN eliminates memory for that classical conditioning. So that indeed is a very intriguing finding because it indicates that for a very simple response like this, this classically conditioned eye blink response, that's the locus of learning. That is, that is where it is taking place. It's taking place in that lateral Pontane nucleus. So again, he's the first one to show that there's a discrete part of the brain that's involved in certain types of learning. Very important piece of research. Uh, and then along comes uh, another researcher by the name of James McConnell, who uh, conducts studies that are generally described as cannibalistic transfer of memory. And he works with planaria. Now, planaria are very interesting. Uh, here's a planaria that you see right here. Uh, planaria are uh, the simplest animal to possess a true spinal cord uh, and to have what we call synaptic type of nervous system like what we have. Um, and uh, what uh, McConnell does uh, in this research uh, I call it the unusual uh, case of planaria. Uh, what he does is he asks, where is the engram being stored? And um, a unique feature of planaria is that, for example, if you were to take a planaria and then cut it in half, uh, the head would regenerate a tail and the tail would regenerate a head and you would have two, uh, two uh, planaria. Uh, and that becomes a very unique feature of this experiment. Let, let's train this planaria in a very simple uh, classical conditioning uh, uh, response. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll cut the planaria in half, allow the head to regenerate a tail and tail to regenerate a head, and then we'll test these animals in terms of their recall of this very simple kind of classically conditioned response. Uh, and what he finds is that both the head uh, that generates a tail and the tail that regenerates a new head, they both remember the classically conditioned response. You know, it's a fascinating finding, one that becomes even more interesting with, with some other experiments that they do. For example, one of the things that they do is they take a planaria and they classically condition it. Uh, and uh, after they classically condition it, uh, they cut it up into small pieces and they feed it to another uh, planaria, uh, a naive planaria, a planaria that's never been involved in this very simple classical conditioning task. And once that planaria now eats that other planaria that uh, in which this uh, memory uh, for this classical conditioning is, is contained, that planaria now will, will act just like a planaria that's been trained in the classical conditioning. So again, uh, McConnell believed once again that this, uh, the engram um, uh, was present in this material uh, uh, from this uh, trained planaria. Uh, and indeed, this is what was responsible for, for transferring this memory. So transfer of memory, um, uh, the last study that he does is he actually extracts RNA uh, from a, a trained planaria, injects it into an untrained planaria, and finds that that untrained planaria now, when it's confronted with this very simple classical conditioning, uh, has memory for it. So indeed, this is a, you know, a fascinating sequence of studies uh, 
uh, this uh, transfer of memory in which, you know, again, RNA, what does RNA do? RNA directs the, pro uh, the production of new proteins. So again, this is a, a study which, which is arguing that uh, there's something about these new proteins that may be very important for the formation of Another interesting study done in this same area, uh, era is one that was performed by uh, Jefferson, uh, in which he was taking a look at uh, depriving uh, rats of sleep after they learned a particular task, uh, like a complicated maze. And um, then um, um, uh, uh, depriving, uh, once again, depriving them of memory. Uh, in, in particular stage of sleep, which is called REM, uh, rapid eye movement sleep. Uh, and um, uh, what he finds, and again, we'll talk more about uh, REM sleep uh, uh, later on when we do get to the whole area of sleep. What he finds is uh, that uh, animals um, you know, that had been deprived of that um, uh, REM sleep uh, showed very profound deficits in terms of their ability to remember what they had learned uh, the previous day. So again, they're trained on one day to a criterion of, of uh, successive correct responses. Uh, then they're deprived of uh, rapid eye movement, what's called uh, rapid eye movement REM sleep. Uh, and then they're tested uh, the next day uh, and again, those uh, uh, that have been deprived uh, of the REM sleep tended not to uh, remember what they had learned. Uh, in other experiments, what they also showed was that those animals that engaged in a lot of uh, uh, rapid eye movement sleep tended uh, to um, uh, perform very well in terms of memory processing. Those animals that did not engage in very much of it uh, did not perform very well. So one of the things that we know from um, this whole area of sleep uh, in terms of rapid eye movement sleep is that there are many new proteins that are being produced during that period of our sleep-wake cycle. And indeed, uh, one of the things that we know is that there's more new proteins produced during that period of time than at any other point uh, in, in your entire sleep-wake cycle. So maybe you know, the formation of these memories, uh, the engram, the formation of the engram may be very much related uh, to the production uh, of, of new proteins and that this uh, uh, period of sleep is one in which you're probably consolidating uh, a lot of new memories. Another very interesting study here, uh, again, one that was conducted in the, in the, uh, the late 1980s is a research that was done by Bernard Agronoff, who is a neuroscientist uh, down at Baylor University. And he did a number of very interesting studies with goldfish. Um, and one thing uh, that we know about goldfish is that they're very good uh, in terms of their ability to learn uh, certain types of uh, what we call avoidance tasks. One such task, <clears throat> a very simple one, was uh, an animal, uh, a fish in an aquarium like what you see here, um, that had to um, jump over a barrier. There was a, a wall that was right here that had to swim over a barrier that went up maybe about two thirds up the way of this uh, aquarium. Um, they would have to swim over to this other side in order to avoid uh, receiving shock. Uh, so there is <clears throat> a light that would come on would shine and then shortly following that uh, about 20 seconds later the goldfish would be shocked um, uh, if it didn't swim over to the other side and indeed goldfish would learn this very rapidly where they will go from one side to the other once that light comes on again they know that it's associated with shock and indeed what they do is they learn how to swim back and forth in order to avoid receiving the shock what Agronoff did in this study is once the animals had learned this response, uh, what he did was to block protein synthesis by injecting them uh, in their skull with pyromycin. And what he found, uh, pyromycin blocks protein uh, formation. And indeed what he found was that these fish upon being placed back into this aquarium and this simple avoidance task, uh, they forgot what they had uh, learned and indeed had to be taught all over again. Uh, so again, you know, more evidence that we're talking about something that may be related to the formation of new protein. 
Uh, and then along <clears throat> in, uh, a little bit more recently, 20 years or so ago, Gary Lynch uh, out at the University of uh, California uh, begins to take a look at what's called dendritic sprouting in a part of the brain, the hippocampus, that we know to be involved in memory formation. And what he finds is that in animals that have learned uh, this response, uh, rats that have learned this response, uh, what we see is this very um, elaborate branching, this sprouting that occurs. Again, it looks like the, the branches of a tree and the small limbs that come uh, from those branches. Take a look at how elaborate this is as opposed to uh, a neuron and dendritic sprouting in the case of, uh, of an untrained uh, animal. Uh, and this was some of the first evidence, again, that we're talking about some actual morphological changes that are taking place in the brain uh, over the course of learning. Perhaps some of the most uh, important work that has been done in this area was work that was uh, the Nobel Prize winning work of the neurobiologist Eric Kandel in which he started to take a look at a phenomena uh, that we now call long-term potentiation. LTP, again, you'll often see this. This is the acronym for long-term potenti long potentiation. Um, what, here, here's what Kendall is doing in, in his experimental work. He is recording from uh, single uh, neurons. Um, and um, he's exciting these synapses by applying a current to these synapses that you see here. Okay. And he's going to be recording on the membrane what happens in terms of uh, voltage changes. These uh, areas that you see right here where the synapse uh, is located, these are called NMDA receptors, okay, all along this in this postsynaptic area that you see here. So he's exciting these synapses, and now he's recording what happens uh, in the cell membrane. Um, and if you take a look <clears throat> at what he finds, uh, this is work that he did in mice. What he finds is here, here is when this stimulus is being applied, okay, to this, um, uh, to this axon, to both of these axons. Okay, and what you see is this dramatic change that occurs, okay, right here. This is in response to the first time that this stimulation is produced, and we're recording right here. You're getting a, this downward deflection means that there's a change in terms of the current flow in the postsynaptic cell, okay. Now what he does is, he waits a period of time, one hour later, and then he applies the stimulus again. And here you can see this huge increase that occurs. And this is something that is called long-term potentiation. He found that this is something that lasts a long time. Uh, for several weeks following this first stimulation, if he provides a second stimulation, same amount of stimulation, Again, you get this increased sensitivity that occurs. So what he believes then is that in these neurons, in the hippocampus, an area that's known to be involved in memory processing, and as we will see later on, we take a look at Alzheimer's disease, for example, in which there's memory deficits. Uh, the hippocampus is a, is a site for um, um, uh, problems in terms of uh, what is happening to neurons there in uh, individuals who have memory uh, problems. So again, uh, Kandel believes that these single neurons in the hippocampus become increasingly sensitive to stimulation. Those LTPs can continue for many weeks following that first stimulation. So this was Nobel Prize winning work um, of uh, uh, Eric Kandel that's really helped us in terms of understanding them. Uh, another fascinating theory is one that was advanced uh, by uh, psychologist James McGaw. It's a theory that's called state-dependent memory. Um, and uh, to put it in a nutshell, uh, James McGaw believes that memory is also associated with very specific kinds of physiological states. And let's say you study something 
and that puts you into a particular physiological state. If you're in that same physiological state later on, let's say several days later, you're going to be able to retrieve and remember what you learned better than if you're not in that same physiological state uh, that was evident when you were first learning that. Um, let me let me try to illustrate this in this slide that you see right here. Let's say you had a glass of wine uh, while uh, while you're uh, studying. Maybe you have a, a math test coming up in a few days, and um, uh, so that puts you into a a particular physiological state. Uh, and uh, then um, you may recall uh, what you learned that day better than uh, if you have a drink while you're being asked to recall a uh, drink of wine while you're being asked to recall uh, what it is that you learned in terms of the, those basic mathematical principles. I'm not advocating uh, drinking while you study. Uh, I'm just trying to illustrate this, this state dependent uh, effect that uh, uh, James McGaw uh, argued uh, very uh, uh, effectively uh, was part of the memory process. So if you then uh, have that drink during that recall period, that same wine produces that same physiological state, then you're going to be rem you're going to be able to remember better what you learned here than if uh, you don't uh, have a drink. So again, um, what I'm doing is, is just illustrating uh, the state dependent kind of effect. And clearly, I think you should be sober all the time while you're studying, but I'm trying to illustrate to you, you know, a, an important principle. Let's look at this a little bit further in terms of what we know about the involvement of hormones, for example, in, uh, in memory. Uh, follow these boxes, please, from, from left to right. Here's the state that you're in during uh, initial learning. And let's say that you're slightly aroused. And uh, what we know is that arousal produces changes in this hormone, which is called cortisol. Uh, and then let's say several days later, you're, you're asked to remember what it is that you learned uh, to, to recall it. And um, if you are in this uh, same aroused state, again, that's associated with cortisol release, then your memory is going to be really, really good. But if you're in that recall period in a low arousal state uh, that's associated with very little cortisol being released, then your memory is probably going to be poor. Uh, so indeed, these are, these are interesting findings. And, and um, you know, we're, uh, uh, I, I think at some point in time, we're going to get to a point where um, maybe you're going to be able to go into a pharmacy and actually buy a pill, for example, that's uh, going to help you to unlock memories. Here's what we know then. Here are our conclusions. You know, the biochemistry of learning and memory suggests that, you know, the formation of new proteins in the brain, uh, you know, may produce morphological changes in, in very discrete brain areas. Uh, we also know that the electrophysiology of learning and memory uh, suggests that there are you know, neurons in discrete parts of the brain uh, that become more sensitive. You know, the Nobel Prize winning work of Eric Kandel. Um, and I think that there's evidence that, you know, there's biochemical changes, electrophysiological changes, morphological changes, hormonal changes. Um, uh, they, they may be the key to understanding how we learn, how we remember, and how we forget. Um, so, uh, again, this is a very um, uh, interesting work, and, and our next um, lecture will, will expand a little bit more um, uh, in some of these er other areas of uh, the study of consciousness.